Hello, thanks for being here and have an opportunity today to share with you a really special interview. Um, we have the opportunity to talk today with Dr. Nathan Lentz. He's a professor at John Jay College in the City University of New York, professor of molecular biology, who is one of my favorite authors as well, having authored Human Errors, a great book on human evolution, and perhaps why we were not so intelligently designed after all. And he comes to us to share time today because here in the midst of the great quarantine, he's had the unfortunate opportunity to be a recovering patient of COVID-19. And he's gonna share with us some of his experiences. And it does help us that he also is a molecular biologist and has insight into this that so many folks don't. So Dr. Lentz, I'm thrilled that you're able to share time with us here and that we're able to do this with me here in Texas and you in New York City. So I'll let you have the, uh, have the stage now and thanks again. Well, it's my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I, I should say at the beginning, I'm not a virologist or an infectious disease specialist, uh, but I am a scientist and, and once it became clear or became likely that I had the uh, illness, I did, um, it, it, it rather focused my reading quite a bit on, on uh, COVID-19 uh, and on public health in general. Uh, so I, I can share at least my experiences there. Um, I um, also had the displeasure of starting the quarantine a little bit before everybody else in the country, uh, even before my colleagues, most of my colleagues in New York City, because my college had a case, a student tested positive very early in this epidemic. Um, I want to say around March 9th. And so we shut down the campus with the hopes of, of reopening it. We, we, we were never able to. Um, and so I've been, I've been working from home for, um, since March 9th. Um, I did uh, end up getting sick uh, about 10 days after that. I don't really know uh, where I got it, where I picked it up. I don't, I don't think it was from campus, uh, even though we have had, had several ca uh, cases, and, and including one uh, faculty member in our department has passed so away. So would I say that you, you would qualify as a case of community spread then? Yes, I, I can only guess that it's community spread. And um, I do live in Queens, which is the, the US epicenter. Um, and so there were probably a lot of positive patients around me. I could have picked it up from one of my kids. Most kids tend not to be uh, very ill. Uh, and both of my, my children did run fevers in the month of January. So that, that's not the right timing to have given it to me, but it does explain why they didn't get it from me. Um, so we don't know until the antibody test becomes more widely available. We don't know who's who's had it. I don't know where I picked it up. I just know I started feeling unwell. It took me a couple of days to realize that's probably what was going on because I was being careful. Um, so I my first sign was a fever, my first symptom, um, and it was on a daily cycle. So I didn't really think too much of it till day two or three when I started when some other symptoms started to pile up, and um, and and also the shortness of breath. Uh, which was a very unusual symptom for me. Even when I'm sick, I, I don't tend to have um, trouble catching my breath like I did with this one. Um, so yeah, that was my experience. And it, it, I was sick for about 20 days. I think I counted my first asymptomatic day um, after three weeks. And um, I'm now about uh, nine, nine or 10 days recovered. Uh, and I hope immune. We don't know how long immunity lasts. We know. Right. That, I think that that will be a, a huge question for us to ask. Very, very important question. We have so little evidence of immunity in the previous coronaviruses. Certainly, those yes. that give us the common cold provide almost no long-term immunity, and we have minimal uh, scientific evidence from either SARS or MERS. So. Right. That's right. We 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 just don't know. Uh, what we know from Wuhan and from the earliest uh, sites of infection in Asia is that reinfection is incredibly rare or unlikely uh, within a few months. So that's a good sign. It means we can get on top of it. If it were, if you could be reinfected very quickly, I mean, frankly, Wuhan would just be a cesspool of infected people right now. Uh, so we know that reinfection in the short term is unlikely. We don't know how long immunity lasts. Um, and because it is an RNA virus, um, we have every reason to believe it will be uh, able to evolve very rapidly. Uh, and that's, that's worrisome. And could you maybe, for, for certainly some of my middle school students and the general population, why is it that an RNA virus would allow it to evolve so much faster than it if it were a DNA virus? Right. So the viruses have almost none of their own machinery. They're simply really just a genome of some kind. So, so a, a piece of DNA or RNA 
uh, and in, in the smallest, tightest possible package. And that's it. Uh, they don't really have organelles or any of the machinery to, to even replicate themselves. So they're called obligate parasites, obligate intracellular parasites, meaning, meaning they just don't, they, they can't survive outside of a living cell. Well, their genome is made of RNA, the coronaviruses are, also like rhinoviruses, which, which are the, the most common colds are caused by a rhinovirus. Uh, these RNA viruses uh, use the cellular machinery for transcription, which is much more error prone than the cellular machinery for DNA replication. We are very good at replicating DNA, our cells are, uh, with, with fidelity, with accurate repli replication of DNA, but we're much less careful when we replicate RNA. Um, just because RNA is meant to be short-lived anyway, we just really don't care as much about little mistakes. Um, but however, when a virus is, uh, uses RNA as its genome, those little mistakes, uh, mutations we call them, help it evolve rapidly because it's constantly introducing little kinds of changes, little tinkering around. And of course, any of that tinkering that results uh, in a virus that's, that's different uh, appears different in the immune system, meaning our antibodies won't work anymore. So that rapid evolution really makes it a moving target for our immune system. And so as far as our immune system is concerned, it's a new thing again. Um, however, let me say one thing about what makes this one so much worse than, for example, influenza or rhinoviruses and whatever else. We call it a novel coronavirus. What does that mean, a novel coronavirus? Well, what it means is it's not simply a variation of a strain that we've seen before in the human population. It has jumped recently from another species. And we're not entirely sure what that is. People were thinking pangolins for a while or bats. Some species, some animal species in Wuhan, um, it, it, it jumped to humans from there. Because it's novel, because it's not just a variation of something we've seen before, none of our antibodies recognize it, even a little bit. So it runs through our body unfettered. No antibodies are binding to it. It is not similar to anything we've seen before. And so during the eight to 10 days that it takes us to raise our own antibodies to this new infection, it is, it is completely unrestrained and it's ravaging, in this case, our respiratory epithelium. And as it's ravaging, um, it's it just getting such a head start on us. Whereas, for example, influenza, if you've ever had influenza before, when you get a new strain, the antibodies that you have aren't perfect, but they're doing something. They're, they're dragging it. They're slowing it down a little bit uh, and targeting it. Uh, uh, for for uh, destruction. And that allows you to catch up with your new antibodies that by the time they come on board, uh, you're, you're not ravaged like you are with coronavirus. So that's the problem with the coronavirus. By the time we raise our own antibodies that are specific, it's already done a ton of damage. And let me talk a little bit about the damage that it does. Since it does target our, our alveolar cells and our respiratory surfaces, it just leaves our lungs wide open to secondary infections. And it's really those secondary infections that are, uh, are killing people. And, and I'm talking about pneumonia, either bacterial pneumonia or viral pneumonia. Um, when you just ravage the inner lining of your respiratory epithelium with, uh, with coronavirus, you're just wide open to these secondary infections. Right, and that was one thing in, in looking at your, um, your blog post on this, I noticed that one of the medications you took was an antibiotic. That's and right. my first reaction time. was, wait a minute, that shouldn't work. But I right. then, of course, I realized that was to treat the secondary bacterial side of things rather than the actual viral issue. That's right. That's right. There's no, no drugs right now uh, that can directly target coronavirus that we know of. Uh, some drugs are being explored, protease inhibitors, uh, number one, which are also used against HIV. Uh, they're exploring a couple of, of nucleotide analogs. They're also, um, they're also exploring hydroxychloroquine, which has gotten a lot of press. Um, which does have some antiviral properties. There's some reason to think it could work. We don't know yet. Uh, caref careful. I took hydroxychloroquine as well. Uh, it also was azithromycin. It's not because um, my doctor knew I had a bacterial infection, but it was possible. And most people with corona do develop pneumonia. Uh, and so you give the z pack as it's called, the five-day course of azithromycin, together with hydroxychloroquine, which hopefully will target both the viral and the bacterial um, pneumonia, whichever you have. Um, and for me, I did get better. Um, the, the question is, what was I on the upswing anyway? You know, the timing of the drugs and the improvement is suggestive, but that's why you need large clinical studies to really know right. if the drugs are doing anything. And, and we just certainly, we just don't have that data yet. Um, 
I think um, that I was on the upswing. I think that I went to uh, urgent care when I had uh, was at my worst, um, and they did, the doctor did hear a little fluid in my lungs, and so that was enough to to say, well, this is this is turning into walking pneumonia. So let's get on top of it. Um, uh, well, had you but, been tested by that point? At what point? No, were not you at that tested? point. I got tested a few days later. Um, I, I I don't I don't know exactly. So so here's why I wasn't tested. So I was in urgent care. And the doctor said that my, that you need to meet a fever benchmark, which I think I met, but you'll also need to meet a benchmark for your blood oxygenation level. And I was at 97 and I don't know what the cutoff was, but that was too good. That was too high. She said, your blood oxygen's too high. And I said, well, do you see me gasping for air right now? <laughs> I, I had to walk 10 feet and I'm out of breath. My blood oxygen's good because I'm a runner. My body's used to working hard to deliver oxygen, so I'm probably going to be more resistant than the average bear. But um, I'm out of breath here, and all I did was walk from the x-ray, because I got a chest x-ray while I was there. I, I just am walking from the x-ray room, and I'm completely out of breath, and I ran eight miles a week ago. So, you know, something, something's up here. And she said, I know, but I can't, I'll have to answer why I released the test, and I, you know, your vitals are fine, so I can't give it to you. She said, your blood pressure is a little high. I was like, what? What is my blood pressure? She said, it's 140 over 110. And I was like, I just had a physical That's three really, weeks ago. Yeah, I had a physical really three weeks ago, and it was 105 over 60. So that, I'm sorry, that's way high for me. Yeah. Uh, she's like, well, I can't do anything about it. Uh, but luckily, my own doctor was able to get all of his presumptive COVID patients tested. I think there's some informal studies going on because he sort of basically said, uh, if it's positive, I have to take uh, azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine. And I was like, I have to? He said, yes, I will not test you unless you agree to do that. And I think there's some informal studies going on or something like that. Anyway, uh, and so he was able to test me. All of his patients were positive, by the way. Everyone that was tested was positive. And he said- uh, How many were tested in this pool? In his, uh, among his patients, it, there were nine. And he's in practice with other doctors. And he said it was the same for them, that everybody who they thought had COVID did test positive. So this thing is everywhere is the point. And because of all this social distancing, it's probably going to be a very good influenza year. Um, <laughs> we're not going to be getting, so I know, I've actually, I've said to my pharmacist here in Texas, I can't wait to see what the end of season influenza numbers look like. Yeah, I think it's they should be a lot lower than a regular year for that. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And uh, well, when, but when I was in urgent care, I had to say it was kind of frightening because everybody in the waiting room uh, was pres presumptive COVID. That's the only reason people are going to urgent care right now. And um, which is one of the, the problems. I'll, we can talk about that later. But um, uh, two older ladies came in separately, not, not together, uh, one slightly before me, one slightly after. They both were seen first, of course, uh, and they both left in ambulances. Uh, so, I mean, that's kind of what we're seeing. You see, you hear sirens in Queens all the time now, and there it's ambulances carrying people to the emergency room, uh, many of whom are never, never going home. Um, it's really, it is a frightening experience right now. The death rate in New York City, so the, the number of individuals who are dying every day is four to five times the number amount, the normal amount. Um, so we're just being inundated with death uh, in the city. It's not, this is right. no joke. I, I will have to say, I, uh, one of the things that hit closest to home for me, um, and I think you know, I grew up in New York City, Mm -hmm. And when you grew up in New York City in the 70s and early 80s, one of the places you went to go play ball, soccer, football, was out on Randall's Island. Mm -hmm. And I saw a New York Times, I was reading a New York Times article, and they had a photograph of the refrigerated morgue trucks parked on Randall's Island mm -hmm. on the very fields that I used to play yeah. middle school sports on. And that just... Yeah, no, the, the we're, they are literally inundated with bodies at the medical examiner's office. They, they're right now hiring. I just got a job posting because I, I work in the forensic science department, among, among other things, and they're hiring 42 full-time technicians in the mortuary services for the medical examiner, 42 full-time positions, new full-time positions yeah. to try to deal with the influx um, of, of, of those who have perished. And, and so it's, it's just a massive number uh, that are dying every day. Um, not all of them are COVID related, but the problem is that um, other forms of death will accelerate right now also. Um, and that's really the problem with overwhelming. All, all of our hospitals have become COVID hospitals. No, they're not doing other kinds of procedures right now. So if you need a heart bypass, you're just waiting. 
both your decision, but also um, the hospital doesn't want to subject you to that kind of risk right now, which means you're not getting the care that you need. You're not getting the bypass. You're not getting the stent. You're not getting these other procedures. So we're going to see a wave of other kinds of death um, over the next six to nine months as people are not getting care. Yep. And that's one thing we've just reopened here in Texas, um, our hospital for elective stuff in areas that are not being overwhelmed yet by COVID cases. Um, because yeah. that was a, a concern here. It's a big concern. It's, I mean, and, and for example, the number of people who die at home alone in New York City every day is typically between 15 and 25. That's the number of people who die at home every day. Right now it's over 200 and it's been over 200 for about five weeks. Now, not all of those are COVID patients, of course, but they're all COVID related mostly because what happens is somebody somebody's having chest pains or they're not feeling right. They should go to the emergency room but they're not because they don't want to get COVID. So they, I'm going to sleep this off and they have a heart attack and they die or they have a stroke or they have whatever. So um, while it, they might not have had COVID, but I would count that as a COVID related death right. because it's exactly it's yeah. leading to all these indirect effects. Um, anyway. Well, and so, yeah, and that, so you're, you're the difficulty for you in getting tested reflects, I think a lot of our, our, our big issue of, as I look at this right now, we're, we're here, you know, it's April 21st. A lot of places are looking, can we open up? And there's a big push to open places up. Uh, certainly yeah. Texas here has just announced plans to start opening businesses and some, some more public spaces like state parks and the like. Yeah. But, um, but your thoughts on our ability to begin that opening up and what should it look like versus how will we be ready to know we are ready to open up? Right. So there's really two things that you need to have in place in order to start to open up safely. First of all, you need a lot more testing than we're doing because you really need to know uh, who's immune and who's not or who, who recovered and who's not. Uh, so that's the antibody test. But even just who's, who's carrying the virus as an active infection right now, we don't know that. We don't have near enough tests um, to do that. But the second thing that you need is you need to be firmly on the downward slope of new infections, of daily new infections. You need to be not just flat, but firmly on the down slope. If you have that plus testing, um, then you can start to slowly open up, which means not public gatherings, not crowded bars and restaurants, but you can start to open up things like beauty salons and other kinds of retail stores where people are still practicing distancing, they're still wearing masks, they're still washing their hands, but people who are recovered or who are very low risk can start to venture out again. But you have to do that slowly and carefully or else you'll get a second spike. Uh, in 1918, they, start, they eased the social restrictions too early. And the second wave of influenza in 1918 was worse than the first wave. More people died in the fall than in the spring because they just got tired of the restrictions. And so they removed them because they were tired of them rather than it being the right time. There is a right time to do it, but you have to let the science and the virus set the timetable, not, not our uneasiness. So New York City is looking at beginning to open up June 1st. We were the hardest hit. We were also the first hit. So the way to open up quickly is to do the restrictions as well as you can. The ones who will open up first are the ones who uh, really get on top of it and are really strict about their distancing. I think New York City, the June 1st will probably be pushed back, but I think sometime in the June, but that does not include schools. It does not include uh, bars. It may include some restaurants with capacity restrictions, but not bars. And um, none of the beaches will open up. None of the concert venues will open up. None of the professional sports will happen. So it's going to be a very slow easing through the summer. And then maybe in the fall, if that goes well, we might be able to work. But you have to be very firmly on that downward slope of new infections, of daily new infections. And the only way you'll even know where you are is if you have lots of testing. So we need to know who's had contact, who's been uh, recovered, and who has an active infection right now. And I think, honestly, nursing homes and other long-term long care facilities need to be on complete and total lockdown. And here's the problem, is everybody that works at those facilities has a home and a family potentially. Um, and, and you, you know, and those people have contact with other people. It's just really, really hard to be truly isolated from the risk. Um, and so, um, you know, what you do as an individual really does affect somebody who's vulnerable. You don't have to have direct contact with somebody who's vulnerable to still be putting them at risk because you're in contact with someone who's in contact with someone who's in contact with someone who is vulnerable. 
But it's almost and, like we have our six degrees of separation takes on a whole new meaning. It does, and, yeah. You, you, and you just can't predict who that will be and when it will happen. And when the, when the cases start to go down, people, people interpret that the wrong way. They say, well, see, we didn't need to do all this. It's dying on its own. It's like, no, it's starting to die because we're doing I, I just showed a graph of that to my students today. The idea that, yes, we're going to, ideally, I want to be teaching next year that we overreacted because the caseload was so low. We flattened things so well, it looks like an overreaction. When in reality, the best possible outcome, <laughs> tens of thousands of lives, and and, yeah. and that becomes you almost wind up having to prove the negative there. Right. Yeah. I, I re, it and I relish me. the ability to try to do that. Right. Right. And th there shouldn't be a political cost with being overly cautious anyway. <laughs> right. I mean, I remember in New York City. Uh, this is back when Bloomberg was mayor. Um, he there was a big storm coming, so they canceled schools, closed a whole bunch of stuff. And then at the last minute, the storm turned away and went out into the ocean and didn't come. And everyone was mad at the mayor. He was like, look, that's the best outcome. We were ready and it didn't happen. <laughs> like, why can you be mad at us for being too ready? Yes, there's a cost that's associated with all of this, but the economy comes back. All the fundamentals are there in terms of our natural resources, our human capital, our human labor. The economy will absolutely come back. It will absolutely come back. Um, but it will come back with hundreds of thousands of fewer people if we're not careful. Right. Um, and also, if we open up too soon, nobody's going to all mm -hmm. of the open things because right. people are going to stay home. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Um, I want to also talk a little bit about um, the one thing that we don't know about this disease is what kind of long-term disability some of the recovered patients will have. We're only talking about mortality right now, which is just one possible outcome of the COVID infection. What we do know is that it is, it is hepatotoxic. Not even the medicine, the disease itself seems to be doing liver damage in some patients. Um, yeah, and and for, for those folks who don't know the uh, terminology, hepato means the liver, hepatic, the liver, so liver toxic in this case. That's right. It seems to be having uh, um, liver toxicity and neurotoxicity, potentially brain damage in some patients. Um, this is not something you see with influenza. Uh, this is not something that we saw with the other coronaviruses even. We don't know what's causing that. It's probably the immune response, but we don't know that for sure. Uh, but what we know is that um, if you concentrate only on mortality and you can say, well, unfortunately, the vulnerable people are going to die, but that, that'll be it. No, that's not true. Perfectly healthy people can come away with liver damage. Or uh, we're also seeing joint problems, joint inflammation. Uh, in some uh, recovered patients that had that didn't have joint problems before, so you can imagine if you're someone with rheumatoid arthritis, you already have inflamed joints, or even osteoarthritis later in life, uh, you already have inflamed joints, and then you add this to the equation, it could be debilitating. So we are only now beginning to grasp what the other health consequences are besides death. Um, and, I mean, death ought to be enough <laughs> to scare us, but but just think about all of the otherwise healthy people who could have long term disabilities. So I don't. I think um, one one thing that I, I think that some skeptics of of the social distancing aren't appreciating is that the scientists at the CDC and the World Health Organization they are well aware of the negative consequences of social distancing. They track depression anxiety, and other mental illnesses just as closely as they track infectious diseases. They are very much aware of the cost that this is doing. That is on the balance sheet of factors of what this is doing to people. And poverty and, and the other, and joblessness, all of these things are in the equations. It's in the math that people are doing uh, with this. And they're still recommending, um, because remember, the CDC has no ulterior motive other than to keep people healthy and to to save lives and right. no one at the cdc that. is getting reelected anyway so they're right these are not politicians and they're not business people they don't make big salaries they really just care about the public and its health and when they say unfortunately you should you need to stay at home uh they're doing that because they know it'll save more lives than it will cost but this will cost lives some people will stay at home and their mental health will deteriorate um, almost beyond we, we know that that'll happen um, and unfortunately, that might be one of the prices that we have to pay. However, what one thing is, is that you can do something about that. You're not powerless to help your friends and loved ones who are experiencing those negative effects. You can't do anything about, uh, about their health if they get corona, but you can do something about their health if they become depressed. I'm not saying you can cure it, but you can help, right? Because so right. and, and in many ways we talk, you know, it should be physical distancing is what we're doing. Because exactly. in many ways, we're trying to reach out 
and be more socially connected in many ways. That's I know as I, an example, my, this will be my 35th uh, high school reunion this June, and it's already been uh, put off or canceled or who knows what. But um, our class has started to get together and, and have video conferences every week, just as our virtual reunion. And people we ha who haven't known each other much over the last 35 years are getting reacquainted. So it's a really nice social reawakening, and we can make that happen. That's, that's wonder, wonderful isolated. to hear, John. Yeah, that's wonderful to hear. S same with me. My, my siblings and I have spoken more on the phone in the last month than we <laughs> did for the six months before that. So that's great. And John, let me also say, you look great for someone who has a 35-year reunion uh, this year. <laughs> 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 I think being around all those middle schoolers uh, has helped. Yes, well, <laughs> well, well as, a, as a teacher, you either age rapidly or you don't. Right. Although, for what it's worth, there are some days that this is me. Yeah. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> so um, is there anything as, as a scientist, as well as, as a recovered patient, that is bothering you that people aren't hearing about? You know, that um, isn't being covered in the media, or you right. wish more people knew about related to COVID? And then we'll, we'll wrap it up with that. Well, I mean, I think that the, the two, biz, two big misconceptions um, that I, I wish pe people thought about more is number one, my case, uh, I was very, very healthy and this thing made me very sick. It's, it's probably the sickest I've ever been in my life. Uh, 20 days um, of, of, of harsh symptoms, fever, headaches, body aches, uh, night sweats, disrupted sleep, uh, sore throat, coughing, and just completely out of breath. And I'm in the best shape of my life. I run regularly, I go to the gym, uh, and I, I, it, it still got me. So healthy people can get sick from this. And some of them are even developing long-term uh, disability uh, from that, that we're just now starting to appreciate. So that's one thing, is that it really can strike anybody. Uh, yes, it's worse for the elderly, but so is every other infectious disease. Um, and then the second thing is all of the, as we talked about, the ancillary side effects of an overwhelmed hospital system. Um, and so it's that flattening the curve phenomenon is not just about being able to handle the COVID patients. It's about also being able to tend to everybody else who has health needs right now. Um, because if the entire hospital system is consumed with COVID, uh, then other people are not getting care that need it, both on their own part, because they don't want to go to the hospital, but also because the hospital's overwhelmed. So, I mean, most of the hospitals in New York City have become COVID hospitals. Tons of floors that used to be for every other purpose are now just for COVID patients. And that means, and a friend of mine is a kidney uh, transplant um, physician. He, he's not a surgeon. He's the, he leads the medical aspect. They've completely shut down their transplants um, for kidneys um, as they have at most places in the country. So there are people who desperately need other kinds of medical procedures that are not getting them. Um, and so this is serious and your actions really do affect one another. Um, so, but there's a positive side to that. And that is, it, it, it can be empowering in the sense that there is something you can do. Um, with a lot of things, you feel like there's nothing you can do. But in this case, you can. You can stay home. You can encourage other people to stay home. And you can also keep in touch with, uh, like, uh, my husband and I both have this thing where some of our single friends and other friends that, we're, that we know are, are fairly isolated right now, we've sort of split them up. I was like, you take them and I take these and we're going to text them regularly. You know, we're sort of deciding who's our responsibility, who we're going to try to check in with regularly, who we know was having a hard time even before this. And so, um, you know, you can do that too. It can make you feel like you're contributing because, because you will be. So um, Queen Elizabeth said it, like we can all look back on this time period and feel proud that we all did our part. Um, and that might just be stay at home <laughs> and be bored, but that's what's called for right now. Right, um, and, that's, and, and the fact is, yes, that we have the technology now to reach out and actually take care of people at a distance in ways that yeah. we couldn't have done, say, during World War II. Right, oh, right. Uh, we Previous generations it. were drafted into battle. So uh, just right, we're being drafted that. to sit on the sofa. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or maybe talk with each other via Zoom. I, I can live with that yeah. aspect of it. That's right, that's right. Well, Dr. Lentz, I really, really appreciate your, your willingness to take time out of your day here uh, to share your experience uh, with my students as well as to other folks who are going to um, enjoy getting this, um, this perspective on things. All right, you bet, John. Thank, thanks so much for the phone call and um, you know, keep doing the good work. All right, thank you very much. All right, take care. 
All right.